uh, you need to unmute. Yes, I have mm -hmm. unmuted. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's really a pity I can't see you, um, but um, I'll try to be as personal and involved as possible. And maybe we uh, can have some people turn on their cameras to make it more engaging, please. Yeah. Is that then, uh, then you would see me talk in a little corner, right? <clears throat> Probably. Okay, so um, yes, uh, inside, outside. Um, actually, I started uh, um, with uh, doing art college uh, when I was young and then uh, worked for the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam uh, the, at the Applied Arts Department. And I was always interested in making gardens and uh, exhibitions became my freelance uh, work after the Stedelijk Museum. And um, this already shows a kind of breaking open of spaces that are usually very isolated and shut uh, to the outside world. Uh, I started in 1985. Uh, on my own, made exhibitions and interiors and worked with OMA quite a lot indeed, as uh, was said in the introduction. Um, and in 91 started this inside outside studio. We are now in this place. And I have two partners, uh, Jana Krepon on the right and uh, Aura Luz Melis in the middle. And this is uh, when we were having a party five years ago to, to make that an event and an official announcement. Um, Aura is architect and engineer and Jana Krepon is landscape architect. And we are a team of about 12 people. You know, the team changes all the time, except of course the basic, um, yeah, the base of, of our team. We have Luz, uh, office manager, and also Peter, who works uh, already 20 years with me on curtains and that kind of things. So we have a studio where everyone uh, sits together. Um, so we exchange, um, well, conversations, but also literally inside, outside, and exhibition design. It's a group of creatives and many architects, but also cultural anthropologists, or interior architects, uh, etc. So we are a multidisciplinary team. Uh, we are very, maybe through my influence, uh, very hands-on. We like to make things, test things, and install things as much as possible ourselves. And I believe that is very important because you need to get familiar with materials and, and, and really start to understand what materials can be and do and manipulate them uh, to your liking or, or you know, according to um, the issues uh, requested by a commission. So we're basically really interested, as you might all know, about inside and outside and also the connection between the two, uh, but also the trajectories, the movement through space and uh, the experiences that you can um, trigger um, moving through a certain uh, world, whether inside or outside. And we work in many different climates, but here's a bit of a, a sketch uh, I did for uh, a project in Riga, where it could be really very cold. So, you know, it's sometimes literally that you want to make gardens both inside and outside. And for us, it's very important that this link is always there, that there is a fluidity between the worlds and views in and out and also the treatment sometimes of landscape um, in a way that is a bit unexpected and more interior like, which is, of course, also a tradition in landscape uh, um, ages ago. So nothing new, basically, except that, of course, modern architecture is much more transparent. And so you can literally um, make things uh, fluidly go into one another and represent, for instance, in the Seattle Library landscape in the in a textile uh, material. Uh, these are the carpets we made then of uh, photographs. I always make of, of plants and plant structures. And you create in that sense a connection <clears throat> that is really physically literal. And you can also work as we do, do with curtains that you work with reflections and, and 
uh, echo uh, what is going outside and bring it inward. So as I said, we work uh, quite internationally. That has been told also in the introduction. That means that we are uh, working in many different climates and that for our work, both landscape, gardens, plantings, and of course also textiles and that kind of materials, they're both very much uh, influenced by climate, by humidity, by change of temperature, etc. So in the curtain uh, uh, story of curtains, uh, I think we have now 35 years of experience in making curtains that uh, solve issues such as temperature, uh, light, UV light, of course, uh, influencing objects in the interior, acoustics and spatial uh, uh, issues that uh, often need to be solved in a very technical manner. So, of course, we, we did a lot of studies with engineers and architects about what a textile object can do in both outside a building uh, and in the facade and behind the facade. And we work very closely with uh, climate engineers and sound engineers, and lighting engineers to measure everything we do. Uh, and that's a very sensitive subject and very interesting subject to work with. But we realize in our work, as you can imagine, that it's also a collaboration between uh, the landscape, the shading, the natural uh, way of cooling and, and, and creating draft and wind and cooling through your uh, landscape uh, uh, elements, such as, of course, uh, trees and shrubs, etc., and uh, possible curtains that cool the facade. So that collaboration is interesting to us and also the discovery I did many years ago that a curtain, a, a piece of cloth used in a house or in a building and the garden can literally have a kind of ballet together, which is really an attractive thing. So it can be a, a thin fleece and it can move in the wind and it can have its own life um, very much connected to gardens and the exterior. Um, the path and the track to us is also a connection um, because the path is, of course, choreographing uh, the movement through a place, a landscape, a garden, and uh, the track also influences the choreography of the movement of the object itself, but also of the people um, manipulating the curtain and moving around it and uh, having this object as part of the influence on uh, the behavior of public. So the path as a uh, romantic element, an efficient element, and the track as also something that we discovered with the architects that it can be a totally integrated part of the architecture, no longer an addition, but having its own role and its own functions and its own drama and presence. And so that is what I call the emancipation of the curtain, that it is really a thing in itself with uh, its own power and architectural role. And the combination of the technology with the cloth, let's say, is of course a very beautiful uh, marriage and a very necessary one. And so a curtain can, as you can see here, create real rooms and be an architectural element in itself. So, yeah, I can go on about curtains quite a lot and quite a long time because we also weave curtains and uh, have enormous uh, uh, involvement in every detail, but also in the organization of its movement, such as here in the Architecture Biennial in 2012, where a motorized system changed the, uh, the interior of this Rietveld Pavilion in, in Venice uh, in 12 different positions in a certain speed. We also use the curtain as an exhibition tool in, in Zurich uh, two, three years ago and uh, as a division tool and an announcement tool for exhibitions, etc. And one of the things we, we like to um, yeah, research is, of course, how a curtain can also emancipate itself from the architecture. And so we try to create these um, curtains, sometimes completely independent. This is one 
for a concert that we designed for the composer uh, who changed a chamber orchestra uh, performance in different theaters, different sizes, different heights. And this curtain could uh, change itself into any position anywhere. And another uh, emancipation is, of course, that a curtain can move outside and become part of the architecture. So that's a kind of uh, introduction. Uh, the greening the city is a big uh, element and a big uh, um, subject, uh, as you can imagine and you all know. And we are part of this uh, movement of, of greening the, the city as much as possible um, because of climate change and because of CO2 and uh, the necessity of absorbing CO2 and of managing uh, water and, and moisture in a very um, economic way. And we are talking about representation. Well, a landscape has, of course, in the urban uh, realm, a lot of layers and a lot of um, different functions. So what in the end looks like a relatively innocent uh, landscape actually is built up of many layers from infrastructure to, to technology, etc. But one of the biggest aims is, of course, to, uh, in this urban realm, create porosity and uh, um, collaboration, let's say, between all the elements of urban development and architecture and uh, uh, infrastructure, traffic, um, bridges, and etc. with the soil. And um, that has always been uh, an interest for all of you and all of us to use water in an economic way, to clean it in a natural manner, to reuse it uh, in uh, any way possible. Um, and to work with architecture in a, in a very close manner so that uh, nature and soil and absorbance and, you know, the, the, the way you manage uh, the, the water, that it is a collaboration between the two. And sometimes we are part of um, conferences or discussions with developers and municipalities to, to talk about how, and in Amsterdam that is very active since two years, how the urban infrastructure, so the unseen, the underground infrastructure, uh, should and can collaborate with healthy and life soil where the soil and the plants and the roots and the microorganisms work together, but in fact also work together with the infrastructure. And then we're talking about protection and uh, cooling, etc. And that's a very interesting uh, development that we are very active in at the moment. And uh, uh, needless to say, we are working on that uh, absorption and necessity of, of uh, live soil and, and, and interaction uh, already for many years. But it seems in this time that everyone is getting more alert and more into it, and also necessarily so, uh, developers are starting to, to feel that um, also the architecture and, uh, and, 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 and the living organisms have to collaborate uh, together. So here are all kinds of examples that we work in very dry areas and less dry areas that landscape can also be porous and have a role in the underground without necessarily having green if that is not possible, but that we uh, do everything to um, help um, with our designs or with our studies, with our research, to see also how developers like here in Greece what the qualities are of a certain site, what can be done to make it a, a very sustainable uh, form of tourism, for instance. Uh, so there's an enormous amount of uh, questions uh, th through not only developers, but also municipalities and the state uh, of how to uh, involve green and, and the garden again, and the health of the soil uh, in, yeah, iconic places such as around churches, etc. 
it, I have to tell a lot of things that uh, each of them are a story in themselves. So <laughs> I have to, but uh, for instance, uh, churches in the Netherlands, they're fantastic architecture from uh, hundreds of years ago. And the whole role of the church needs to uh, come back to, to the community. And uh, so we were asked to look at the role of the exterior, the public space around, how that can influence the interaction between um, the community and the building. Uh, we're also working in the city of Amsterdam on many, many different infrastructural uh, issues to solve uh, traffic and parking and uh, entrances and exits of important uh, um, places. Uh, and we have a form of idealism of that, that we want to always communicate is that if you start to talk about green, it shouldn't just be a little lair or a seemingly green something, uh, because we are a bit skeptical sometimes about what, what is it, you know, a green facade, is it really sustainable or what is a roof garden, is it really a garden or is it just a little lair that cools the interior but that isn't really uh, 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 ecology, let's say. So these are kind of illustrations for commissioners to say, okay, we're not only looking at this urban development to, to make little green layers, but we're really looking in all the um, layers underground and above ground and how you can uh, trigger biodiversity in many different ways. So these are, and I'm, I'm showing these because we're talking about representation. So this is, for instance, uh, an image we made for a discussion with developers who want to um, address a few areas in The Hague, in a city uh, in the west of the Netherlands, so that you can illustrate that, okay, you can make it an urban place where people go through from one place to the next and it can have many functions, but it should also have all the uh, life ecology and all the layers that are necessary to, to make it a real world. Uh, as you know, food uh, forests are <laughs> incredibly uh, fashionable at the moment, also in the city. Um, but of course, we need to look at all the technologies, how you um, integrate trees and everything that works together with trees, because trees alone is not the answer, but trees together with a local, uh, locally thriving combination of plantings and combination with the buildup of soil in the right way for that specific place. Are, are the essential uh, thing to address at this moment. So we're completely into what is under our feet and we try to, uh, in an in a inspiring way, communicate this uh, very often in collaboration, such as here, this book has been published by the uh, municipality of Amsterdam and we were part of the think tank and uh, comments uh, on, on the making of it. And there were many, many people involved uh, internationally and it's become a quite an interesting book. What we are also looking at, uh, at Inside Outside is how, with if we say curtains on one side and, and the landscape and the garden on the other side, and of course the merging of these two as much as possible, could we also think of textiles or weaves or structures or unwoven structures that can have a function as a so-called curtain, but could also attract life? And so we're now uh, in the middle of a study looking at how certain um, materials can absorb moisture and absorb microorganisms and then become a more lively, uh, yeah, natural surface. Um, and the other thing is needless to say that you don't need soil in all conditions and it's also a development at Wageningen but uh, I think internationally that we say okay if cars become less important because we have other means of transport then we could reuse and that's a big issue also in our work reuse existing 
architecture, existing structures, existing buildings, and also existing parking lots underground uh, to produce food and uh, edible uh, plants. So that was the more general story. And now uh, I'd like to show you a few projects. This is a project in Milan where we won a competition uh, many years ago in 2003 and got uh, the contract in 2010 to develop uh, an urban park in the middle of the city where there were many uh, developments around uh, of different developers um, owning land and, and, and creating a huge um, yeah, project of, of, of new uh, buildings, commercial and residential. And in the middle of that, there is this piece of land that was actually um, left to, to itself since the Second World War, and that was used for storage of materials, etc. Um, we made a design that was very aware of the underground world because there are many tunnels, train tracks, parkings, and also hidden canals under that site, but also many different owners and many different uh, political um, situation around this piece of land. Uh, what the question was uh, for the competition was to create a park that connected different areas of the city, uh, governmental, residential, uh, commercial, uh, etc. Uh, it's uh, near to a big um, uh, um, station. And so the first thing we did was to create uh, straight paths that would efficiently connect uh, one place to the next and to immediately imagine that a path can have many different roles a path can uh, be bridge boundaries a path can be a place to be not only to move over and through uh, and if you have this web of paths you create irregular fields in between and we thought it would be uh, interesting to make these fields into different garden typologies, so a different kind of botanic garden. And spread over this botanic garden um, a kind of confetti of circular forests or bosques, and these would be a kind of living um, pavilions that could be used as a space uh, once grown taller after a while so the paths uh, as a place and also to, to to organize markets or fashion shows or exhibitions the different fields as different gardens and each uh, circular bosque as an, a separate group of one uh, species of tree and this was the way we represented it in the competition so uh, this could be one of those circles and could be used as a place for whatever performance or work or what uh, what have you and here illustrating the the three-dimensionality of it and representing it in a model and we were a team of course we had a team with michael maltzen and mirko zardini who's a, a urban theorist uh, Irma Bohm as graphic designer, Pete Audolf as one of the planting uh, designers and uh, landscape uh, engineers. So when we have the commission years and years later, this is how the land looked. It was completely taken by um, the, it's, it's a building site. They were producing concrete. They were storing materials. As you see, there are a few older buildings there. And so we, you really think, ah, we're going to make a park, but if you visit, you see this, this is the condition of that place. And uh, we, we studied uh, the whole place. We also found a local landscape architect, Franco Giorgetta, and his daughter, who have a small landscape office. And Franco Giorgetta was a very valuable colleague uh, because he uh, is from Milan and he knows everything about Milan, but also everything about the climatic and soil conditions um, and air conditions of the city. So a great help in choosing the right uh, plantings in the end. But 
uh, as you see here, uh, this piece of land is not an innocent uh, full soil piece of land, but has connections to the underground. And so there are exhaust uh, and intake uh, for air for the metro lines underneath. There are um, security or emergency exits. There are maintenance uh, openings and a lot of these uh, <laughs> things. And so you need to integrate uh, such things in your park design. We made a study of all the conditions underneath and around and uh, also made a model to understand what we were actually addressing here. The height difference uh, became six meters uh, because of the new development. So the park was going to, as we say in Dutch, lie on one ear going from zero to plus six and uh, needless to say, bridging all these underground conditions. We started to illustrate you, you have to, in the process, convince everyone that it's a good design. Of course, we want it, but then it needs to be realized and you have communications with all the, de the departments of the municipality. And they all have a say and with the developers around who uh, want to use the park and who know that the park is of great uh, economic uh, influence on the value of, uh, of their um, development and of the buildings around. So as a team of designers, it takes years and years and lots of meetings. And this is the way we would map all the comments of the different departments and parties involved uh, and working day and night until exhaustion uh, to get everything right. Because you can draw a, a, a web of paths but if there is topography, all these connections, all these crossovers are a, a complex um, calculation of how to, to make it in the end, you know, to make it really work and to connect everything in a fluent manner. So all these studies were done and, and, and until the plantings, this is a Piet Oudolf original drawing of one of the garden typologies uh, I made some drawings for other garden typologies. And then um, luckily the site was cleaned and a new uh, layers of ground were added. And on the left, you see a, a kind of walrus, but that's the, the, the tunnel of the train sticking through the basic soil. Of course, more soil was added after this image. And so we started to, to to realize and a hugely exciting period started where you really saw it grow. Uh, we were invited to make boards to, to explain visitors how to uh, use the park, where they could find different things to do. You know, there's a playground, there's sports, um, there's uh, uh, fields of herbs, there's a pond, um, and there's one area uh, which is a, a cultural foundation, the Catella Foundation, who needed a fence. And uh, as we are into curtains, we wanted to develop a fence looking like a curtain. And also uh, the obsession that we have that we don't like boundaries very much and uh, limitations very much. We wanted to develop this uh, fence as a social uh, furniture. So it became something where you could sit both inside and outside the park so there was no hierarchy of wherever you are you are part of it and it became also a social you know you can speak with one another um, and so that worked very well in the meantime the bosco verticale was developed by stefano bueri and laura gatti uh, which became an important uh, connection to our park and vice versa so here you see at the opening festivities end of 2018 uh, how the park is uh, being used. But just to show you how we uh, illustrate our, our work, so it goes from sketch to definite design to, of course, construction drawings and then to reality. And one of the things that we learned here in Milan was that landscape uh, becomes more and more mm, how do you say scrutinized? Is that an English word? 
by security, safety, and uh, that kind of thing. So everything needs to be transparent. So even our maze uh, in the in the process was uh, told to be not higher than 50 centimeters, which of course for a maze is not incredibly exciting. Um, so every planting needed to be very transparent or very low so that no surprises or danger would occur in this park. And that is an international thing I'm sure you, you, you know or you will know very soon. One of the most important things to, uh, in creating a landscape, a park, a garden is needless to say the maintenance. And so this whole discussion about maintenance is uh, has and will always be a very uh, important issue. And here, for instance, the developers took over the maintenance uh, and are now managing the park. And that means that they look for after it very well, but they also use it as a cultural venue almost. So they organize a lot of things in the park. Uh, from children, education, um, you know, we, we designed herb gardens for the children that they can grow vegetables and see how it works, you know, how, how a carrot grows, how radishes grow, how salad grows, it's all very important. Uh, so for, from children to, to operas, to concerts, to uh, uh, shows and sports uh, happenings, everything is happening in the park and to our great um, joy we see in instagram a lot of initiatives so this is the running track as a club who goes running in the park and has its own logic of using every path uh, and 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 not using it efficiently but on the contrary as a web that you can spend time on uh, running Another, um, to us, uh, symbolic um, project is in Amsterdam for a campus, a university campus with different buildings. It used to be a very closed uh, area, very dark and very uninviting. And we won a competition uh, to, to create the outside spaces that were uh, actually breaking open this whole area, but also connecting all the different faculties and places. And as it's connected to the uh, Amsterdam canals, uh, we thought we would use the classic uh, materials of our uh, canals, which is a beautiful brick and natural stone and the elm tree uh, that uh, is, is really a, a very known a hundreds of years combination. So we took that and created a different kind of use for it so that um, it became a kind of uh, white ribbon that flows through the entire fac uh, campus and that connects and opens up uh, all the different places so it brings you to inner gardens that you normally don't see it brings you from one entrance to the next and uh, needless to say you don't need to follow the path but the path creates places and moments and also gardens, uh, etc. So this is, for instance, a collage of a presentation, and this is reality. Uh, and every garden has its own theme, so it's either a series of magnolia trees or something else. Uh, as a landscape designer, you're also responsible for the whole execution of your design. Um, very important to be there and if you can't be there yourself to have someone monitoring very closely how things are actually made this uh, landscape design was not only about beauty and planting and furniture as you see that follows also this ribbon like uh, shapes that we specially designed but it's also about the whole logic of traffic uh, sidewalks uh, water management, uh, maintenance, etc., and soil and build up that you don't see under the um, the street finish. How what what is actually put there so that the trees and everything you plant can thrive. 
uh, edges uh, towards the water were changed so that students could also meet and sit there. Bridges were developed with uh, uh, an architect who um, improved some of the buildings uh, to make seatings along it, uh, terraces, meeting places, etc. And it is an enormous success for the whole neighborhood because we broke it open, literally. The neighborhood uses the whole campus as a place for uh, walks and, and uh, walking the dog, as it were. So it's a very communal happening there. How much time do I still have? Let's see. OK, I'm fine. Um, another project uh, we were able to do with OMA, in this case, uh, in Doha, in Qatar, uh, OMA built two buildings uh, in Education City, a piece of the city of Doha uh, that was developed since, uh, I guess, 15 years, an urban plan by um, Iso Isozaki. And uh, they built a, a, a national library and a Qatar Foundation headquarters. And we were asked to uh, develop the landscape or the garden um, and also some of the interior finishes, but especially some of the curtains. Uh, yeah, you have to get to know the place you are. And uh, we were introduced to the desert, which has very yeah, empty parts, but also very fruitful parts, as you can see. And uh, we looked around and saw that most of the, and you know that, of course, most of the gardens in very hot climates look approximately like this. So there is a lawn and there are palm trees and there are plants with different colors and structures and uh, especially there's a lot of irrigation. And we wanted to make a change and we were not the only ones, uh, of course, because I think Ido at the time named Ido uh, was doing this whole education city landscape. We only did little parts of that, but in these little parts, we wanted to be really uh, explicit about only using local plants. And I know this is a whole discussion about what is indigenous and what is local and what came and what, uh, what do you call local uh, in the first place. But we tried to study as much as possible to talk to uh, professors of the university. We read their books. Uh, we discovered together with them, or they taught us, that in the desert there are about 15 different plant communities. So as we talked before, the community, the, the collaboration between plants and trees, we know much more about it the last uh, five or seven years, I guess, maybe longer than we knew before. But the collaboration is very important. So these plant communities uh, are different throughout the desert of Qatar. And we wanted to represent these communities in a very graphic garden for the um, uh, Qatar Foundation headquarters. Um, actually, this is not a real garden. It's a plate uh, hovering over a parking lot. And so it is a, a garden composed of planters. And planters are not our biggest uh, hobby. But in this case, it was a very interesting uh, study to see if planters could be filled and, and built up in such a way that you could make the best possible conditions for plants to be growing in an urban circumstance, um, but being actually the, the natural composition of plants. Um, so planters go from large to small and from high to low. And also the water system is from more water to no water at all. Needless to say, you are limited in your water use in such climates. So you're only allowed to use X amount per month, per day, etc. So we didn't spread it evenly over the garden, but not evenly. And therefore, you have a garden that is actually more like a laboratory for the university and for the botanic departments of the university to see how local plant communities behave in a planter 
in an urban circumstance, but also with different amounts of water and what it does to them. And the whole idea of having large planters becoming smaller uh, uh, is that we also wanted to experiment with the um, limiting the um, amount of plants together. So from each planter, you take out one plant, and in the end, there is not a plant community anymore, but there is only one typology, one species growing in one planter. And what does that do? And does that influence the behavior of the plants? Uh, I thought it was, or we all thought it was a quite a simple, nice mathematic idea, but it's of course hugely complex. And also complex in that we know from working at a distance, because you have to manage this, uh, this whole idea. First of all, it took three years to grow all these plants, to, to, to collect all the plants, to grow them in nurseries, but also to import them. You can't just go into the desert and get seeds or twigs. You have to do everything according to regulations about uh, illnesses, bacteria, viruses, etc. So it's a very complex world, the planting world. If you think you're going to plant local plants, uh, what comes around the corner is actually a totally international um, uh, voyage of seeds and fruits and um, and roots to to make it actually happen. Um, we used the underground parking or actually the parking under this plate uh, also to air the parking and the system of planters therefore is not only planters but is also a system of openings where stairs go down but also where trees grow out of the parking upward an enormously complex planting planting system and to communicate it from far away how to distribute the planting and how to place them we made these drawings of of plant uh, patches uh, to make it more clear uh, how to implement them here you see how they're grown the building is being built each planter is a system in itself they integrate lighting uh, waste paper baskets uh, air intake and uh, exhaust for the parking below so together with OMA, we made it an intelligent system of planters that sometimes are also a, a little um, guard uh, house. Um, so they, they get different roles, as it were. Here you see a stair going down. There you see a tree grow growing through. And so it was built and done. You see travertine uh, in a certain color. And needless to say, the whole composition of the garden is a response to the architecture, as we always work in that manner. And now we are working in Genova. We won a competition with Stefano Bueri and Metro Gramma, um, a competition written by the municipality of Genova after the uh, crash of the bridge a few years ago, which is a big drama, of course. Uh, this is an image uh, of when it just happened. Uh, it, was, it's, uh, it was at a height of about 42 meters. And so buildings are below and train tracks and canals. Uh, and 43 people uh, died while driving over this bridge. So it's a big story and an enormous uh, um, political uh, thing as well, humanistic, social, in, in every sense. And uh, the municipality wants now to create a park, um, yeah, actually under the new bridge that replaces the old one, uh, built by Renzo Piano, uh, also at a height of 42 meters. So below, we are developing a park and um, you can see that it's a very industrial area it's actually completely filled with asphalt concrete train tracks uh, walls and, and and tunnels and industry uh, with also some housing uh, that used to be the workers but now is getting more and more animated um, 
The city of Genova has a huge issue with water. There are many um, moments that the, uh, the water from the mountains and a combination with the rain and a bad sewage system create um, <laughs> anyway, the water uh, comes over the in inundation 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 sorry i just uh, lost the word for a moment uh, and so the whole task uh, there are a few very important tasks for this park it needs to be completely porous and it needs to have an enormously uh, uh, intelligent water uh, management system uh, through porosity, but also through uh, uh, water tanks to keep the water because there are very many dry periods. So it needs to also have a sustainable water distribution system. And the other thing very important for this park is to connect, uh, as you saw, uh, the park, uh, this whole area is very disconnected. All the lines go north, uh, south towards the sea from you know, let's say direction Milan down to the sea through mountains. There are mountains left and right of it. Well, kind of hills, not not such high mountains uh, with lots of forest. Um, but the connections east west are, are totally hopeless. So um, we also wanted to create connection. This is a canal uh, that is sometimes this dry, but sometimes is completely filled with water. Uh, and these are the connections east-west. These are some of those uh, dramatic moments. Um, and so our, our first sketches uh, were for the park, uh, north-south uh, lines of north-south uh, oriented gardens, each garden a different garden typology, um, to use all the local tree typologies, but separate them so that each garden has a certain tree as a main theme. And needless to say, each garden would have a theme about sports, technology, uh, botan botanism, etc. Um, and the, the most important thing uh, architecturally, uh, apart from making new buildings and better industry and reusing existing buildings, is a, a steel circle uh, designed by uh, Stefano Bueri's uh, studio that is for pedestrians and bicycles to connect east-west. But the circle in itself is also um, a machine that generates energy. So there's a whole uh, team uh, working uh, with us on not only creating a park that is completely uh, sustainable in every sense, but also creating a structure higher, a bit higher up that connects everything and that um, uh, also uh, connects to a new uh, station, but also creates energy, sun and wind, and uh, stores it and distributes it in the area. So I think this is an uh, interesting, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, project that it touches upon all levels and also very much social and political levels. Uh, it's it's a, an enormously ambitious uh, 22 hectare uh, site, uh, but it starts like this. This is the kind of sketches of the different trees and how to represent it and how to convince uh, the city and in a competition you want to convince the commission or the jury uh, of your of your intentions uh, with what you're designing so in a very um, lively way with lots of color and sections symbolizing the porosity the, the the whole mentality of what we want to achieve here um, breaking open this this industrial crust and making it a real nature uh, as a kind of tiny piece of a much larger uh, entity but you have to start somewhere is our mentality you can't say oh it's so small it doesn't matter it needs to start somewhere and it's an enormous conversation with the city and the region uh, to really take it serious and go all the way 
And uh, Stefano Guerri is leading our team and uh, he uh, is a very good spokesman together with the Metrogramma architect, uh, Andrea. I forgot his family name. They are very good representatives. Uh, so the three of us are uh, in, in, in regular conversations and discussions. So here are the digital representations. So the 3D renderings where I always have a kind of energy, but I must say it does look convincing and it is good to work with <laughs> renderers uh, as long as you communicate very clearly uh, what should be shown. Here we show all kinds of systems uh, for water management, water and soil management. Uh, and you go through different phases. So uh, this is a part of the, so we won the competition two years ago. And since then we made, a, this is for instance, a whole document to do all the calculations. So you had to have to collaborate with uh, lots of parties to, to make the right uh, financial um, uh, overview okay this is the design but what does it mean and what do we need to do and how much will it cost and this is all only about the park and as you can see in these sections the park is under the current bridge so also needs to take into account all the columns and the underground structures and in the meantime because it's a, such an important uh, social and political project the city asked us to develop some parts already and that has to do with uh, for instance the 43 people who uh, died during the accident they have of course family and loved ones and they formed a foundation and uh, the city wants to offer um, the people who were connected to the deceased some kind of symbolic uh, garden and so we developed uh, in a piece under the bridge a circular uh, kind of podium with a temporary monument for the deceased. Um, we worked with um, an artist, uh, Luca um, Petrone, I think. Anyway, I, I, I will look up the name later, but an artist and together we uh, developed this circle with 43 different trees. Uh, a wooden podium where people can uh, um, make uh, performances also inside the circle uh, have happenings or theater or or, perform uh, or, or lectures whatever um, but these trees that need to be quite a big size need to be placed there temporarily so with laura gatti who's part of our team trees were chosen this was a uh, representation. This is a drawing to, to, uh, to see how to make it. Representation again, and this is then reality. Uh, for us, it was really important with Laura Gatti together to convince the city that it is a temporary uh, installation. It had to stay there for two, one and a half years and that the trees are placed and treated and maintained in such a way that they can survive. So that is a very important uh, issue. Needless to say, air goes uh, to the roots and water and, uh, and, and food, you know, they need to eat. And uh, it's a big success. It's, it's being used enormously well. And it is good on one side, but the municipality now wants to uh, prolong this uh, temporary installation. So we're looking at how to again open up the soil and really plant the trees and redo the circle but in a almost permanent manner and another site is then seriously developed as a memorial for the deceased where an, an existing building is used for a future museum uh, on on this whole uh, terrible um, situation uh, and also a glass house by Stefano Guiri, the museum by Metrogramma and a garden under the bridge again uh, exactly where the bridge uh, crumbled we are making a, a garden and as you saw also in Milan this is a kind of site you you have these are 
tests of the soil to see what uh, what is it made of and uh, also how polluted is it and what can we do to improve it representations of, of the museum and of the future garden this garden like all of our gardens has an enormous ambition of, of, of edible you know it's it's about something terrible happened with people who died but it's also showing that you know life is goes in circles and it's about life and uh, and and continuation of life uh, so this is a very ambitious and beautiful hopefully garden with playgrounds and uh, edible plants and fruits etc and in representation you need to be very serious but sometimes also try to show it in a way that things look a bit innocent and happy uh, and not all too technical uh, but these are already definitive design and that is where we are now. Thank you very much for your attention.